Chief Information Officer at uh, Center for Primary Care. Thanks for coming in today, fellas. Yeah, so you all were having a, a great conversation earlier about the poetic art forms. You were talking about, you know, music and how it ties into poetry and, and how uh, country music is, I mean, you don't have to be educated, but Greg's got academics in his background, and Barry, you have, you have song. And so kind of bring the audience up to speed on what you all were talking about. First by, you know, just introducing yourselves. I know you can introduce yourself, but well, I'm Greg Trador. I'm a, as a, as um, Lucinda said, I am a professor at Georgia Miller Secretary College, an assistant professor of English at the Jolly English is over there. Um, I hold my degree is, uh, in poetry. It's an MFA from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and before that, I've done a number of different things. And we were just talking about music because I was just telling Barry that I actually played bass for a while in my teen years. And, and I'm Barry Allison. I'm uh, the Chief Information Officer for Center for Primary Care. Um, my, I wish that my full-time job was associated with the thing that I love the most. However, um, uh, the second part of what I enjoy in my life, uh, being able to take abstract components, pieces of data, things that are things that exist in, in, in ways and manners that most people can't conceptualize at times, put it into put it into forms and concepts that people can understand. Music is a lot like that. My background is theology um, from uh, Columbia University and uh, Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, and I've been playing drums and percussion for 30 years, uh, which really at this point makes me feel a lot older than I did before I walked in the door because uh, I'm, I'm barely 33. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, so and, and this is my first time meeting Greg. We were talking about similar uh, backgrounds. Greg plays mu or has played music, string instruments, and um, my mom and dad always referred to me as, uh, are you still beating those drums? Not that there was any talent or any form, uh, just beating the drums, so I, I, whenever I ask that question, I always say yes. So. But we were talking about music and poetry, and uh, one of the things that, in, in a previous conversation, actually when we first walked in, we were discussing you know, the similarities in, in the manner in which someone writes a poem, and, and I think, Greg, what, what I would like to understand from your perspective, because you, you teach on a daily basis, and you're, you're working with, you're reading the the concepts and thoughts of your students. What do you find in this day and age? What do you find people writing about and talking about when they're expressing themselves? Oh, a large number of different things. Ethnicity, um, political topics have really become popular in poetry in the last 10 or 15 years. Almost all the great poets are in some way or another political, but I don't mean that in a revolutionary sense, like uh, if they're part of the IRA or the Black Panthers or anything like that, but they're writing about um, politics in terms of their personal experiences with it. Um, we still do get your typical lyric poem, um, or I can't say typical because everyone's experience is different, and the lyric poems are just as good. Um, but that's one of the most striking things that I see. And also, the, a new form of poetry that I was actually just interested introduced to last night by my wife is not really about what writers are writing about, but whose words they're stealing. It's called erasure poetry, hmm. and it's where you get a page where it's already got written text on it. It can be from a novel, it can be from a, tra a travel book, or whatever, and all you do is you find words that you want to use for a poem, and then you scratch everything else on that page out. Hmm. And then you just see Very these words scattered all over the page. <laughs> The interesting thing that I'm, I'm finding music and, and being a music connoisseur, I, I feel like I was born with a, uh, a, a drumstick in my hand. My, my mother's family, uh, she has nine brothers and sisters. They were all musical, they were, but they were all stringed instrumentalist um, fiddles. Now, they're from north of the mountain, North Carolina. Fiddles, banjos, mandolins, guitars. So I'm the only drummer. I'm the only... Um, I like to think of myself as a visual timekeeper mm. um, in the family. And 
what I find, what I'm finding in music and thinking, growing up with with uh, everything from gospel to classical, Elvis was really big. Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I saw Elvis twice um, live. Now I was very young, but I remember it. He was a very charismatic um, performer, just just amazing. One of the things that I find in in, in music today is that people write about what they would like to do and what they want to do. And several years ago, people wrote about what they had done, what they'd accomplished. You know, I think about from my um, from my days in studying theology. I think about David, um, King David. And I think about his you know, the Psalms. And I think about the Proverbs. And I think about some of the things he was writing about. He didn't write about things that he that he necessarily hoped for. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he never wrote about that, but he wrote about the things he did on a daily basis. And he not only wrote about uh, his his days that he was up. He was a realist. He wrote about the things that he struggled with from moment to moment. And uh, you know, it, what's sad is that we find ourselves living for things and not for the moment. Mm, good point. And uh, and so I, I don't know. And I find that in a lot of music. I don't know if you find that in a, in poetry. It it definitely shows up in poetry. Um, all of. Uh, uh, a large amount of it, you know, as I said, is all written before it's political. But too, we do see a lot of, uh, and, and it's kind of common to see despair in poetry. But the despair in poetry these days is much like what you were talking about. It's a despair, a despair over what people want, and not a despair over what somebody had and lost. You know, the, the um, what was it? The, the, what's the cliche of it? Shakespeare's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. You know? And that's the, you know, even though that's a cliche, the thing about cliches is they tend to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's not, this kind of strays from poetry, but I was reading an excellent essay by a, a science fiction novelist named Philip K. Dick. He was responsible if you saw the movie Blade Runner, mm -hmm. uh, Minority Report, Total Recall. He wrote the novels and stories all those are based on. And he's waiting for the day when um, we lose our humanity. And he says the scary thing is going to be when the day comes when we shoot an android and it bleeds, and we shoot a human being and smoke comes out of them. Wow. And you know, and, and that goes along with what you're saying because you know we have so this, this despair about what we want to do, what we, we and we keep ourselves from doing it because we get involved in this daily grind of living for things. Well, I have a question. Um, so it, it seems like the, the the commonality here in terms of humanity, what people write about, what people sing about, the internet, and I think that you had both of you had kind of alluded to it earlier. What do you think that the internet and technology as a whole, how how do you think it's impacted on music and on poetry? I, you know, Lucinda the. This is interesting because I had a conversation uh, a few days ago with a friend of mine that's also a musician. And we were talking about the difference between the 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 days that, and, and I say the days, making it sound like we had just discovered fire. Uh, uh, just in the early '90s, the mid '90s, the the recordings, the recording studio that I was in was analog tape and and racks of equipment and, and different engineering devices and today you walk into a modern day studio and you've got a laptop and you still have some probably some some pretty advanced engineering equipment but nonetheless a lot of a lot of that hardware has been converted into something that a piece of software can do or something that a human once had to do is now being done by by a machine um, Long gone are the days of the of putting the diamond on a piece of vinyl and hearing all of the hearing the crickets in Buddy Holly's background, uh, hearing the the whispers but before the beginning of the song. I think that the internet and technology and I think they've done amazing things for for any form of the arts. I think at the same time, you can almost lose your personality in that, and um, and 
and there's a, I think there's a remnant as in many as in many different forms of the arts and business and life in general there's a remnant of of those that will still leverage the benefits of of anything that they have available including technology but they they appreciate where the art came from and so they buy even though they're leveraging the use of that to to broaden the audience, they still respect the form. Yeah, that, that, that's very true because you know, and this ties in with the internet as well. Not only you know with poetry, but like you said with music. You know, nowadays we get to hear new artists we would never hear before because they might not have gotten a recording contract. They're all the way in Santa Monica or or Los Angeles or New York. But now all they have to do is upload it onto the internet, mm -hmm. and you can hear it. You know, and it's really, really interesting, and, and that's one of the benefits I see out of it. Like you said, you know, you walk into a recording studio, they have auto tune for people's voices, you know, and things along those lines, which I think are detrimental because it's kind of like lying to your audience about your abilities. You know, and, um, and and the same thing too does occur with poetry. It has done great things for poetry. It allows us to read authors who we might not have ever had a chance to read because they too might not have been published in journals. And, it, you know, and when you're published in a journal, a print journal, then one of the issues is, what kind of mood was the editor in that day? Mm -hmm. you know, because if the editor was in a crappy mood, he might have passed over a great poem by a great poet. Sure. And then these days, you know, that poem can still be put online. Same thing with bad poetry though too. Yeah, and that and that brings me to my next question. Because the internet actually, like you, like both of you have said, gives a, um, gives audience access to say otherwise unknowns. But there's also a lot of good poets and musicians who are being discovered. But there's a lot of bad stuff out there too. A lot of bad stuff. I'm gonna cut that later. But what do you what do you um, if if you could if you could say change, change some aspect of that. So, I mean, do you think that it needs to be filtered? Do you think that there needs to be, or do you think that it should just run free? Everybody who has a, who has the thought that they want to be a poet, or everybody who has a thought that they want to be a musician, just because they can go and get a laptop, or just because they can, you know, uh, uh, put together a, 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 um, a, an EPUB file, they should be they should be published, or they should be uh, considered um, musical talent. I mean, do you think that there should be still be gatekeepers? Because as a as a person who uh, who sits and uh, we just we just judged a poetry contest and we we received poems from all over and based on what you were sharing, Greg, some of them are uh, say middle schoolers or high schoolers and they this is their first effort. Some of them are senior citizens who had the dream of being poets and they decided I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, and so as we go through it, the judges go through the process, we are, um, well, I am always amazed at uh, the, what, what people are thinking and the, and the creative process. But I would not have access to, I would say, at this point, maybe 90% of the entries that we receive if it were not for the Internet. And so um, I, I, I understand the benefits, but there's a lot, as a publisher, I've seen what it's done to the publishing industry, and there's a lot of authors out there who self-publish, who you know get a thought in their head, and they they put it together in a book in book form, and they put it out there, and maybe they should have given it more thought, or maybe it's something that they should have just you know, I don't know. I I understand freedom of expression, but maybe they should have just you know, if they didn't have the internet, they could have just written it down, and then put it in a drawer, and so I am one for. Uh, having to have to read through many queries and, 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 and listen to, yes, I'm that person that you describe on a sleepy day. I may have passed out, you know, the, the next great bestseller, but I can live with that now because there's so much. We are just overwhelmed. Um, I, 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 I wonder, should we, should we start thinking about ways to restrict it or where are the new standards? I guess that's, as I'm, as I'm streaming it, where, what are the new standards now? I mean, I, I think that I think there will always, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this analogy, and I've used it before in, in, in other settings. Um, I think that there is a place. Um, I think you, you, inundation is almost an art, 
and we choose we choose what palate mm. we allow, and we choose what goes on that. We choose what we allow ourselves to be inundated with. Okay. Mm -hmm. With that said, there is always going to be a market for fool's gold, but there's always going to be a refining fire. It's very interesting. The way gold becomes gold. Well, I won't take you back to the to the pressure pressurization and underground. <laughs> but in in the refining process, uh, the the goldsmith actually takes the gold and puts it in, in in this device, and they start heating it up. And as they heat the gold up, the impurities rise to the top. Mm -hmm. Well, they take a flask and uh, and they they remove the impurities, and then they turn up the heat a little bit more. They continue to do that until they can see their exact reflection. Every, no matter, no matter what we allow ourselves to be in that with, no matter how much information is out there, we, at the end of the day, have complete control over the throttle. Mm. And we also have complete control over what we consider to be good and great. Yeah, but, but, but to piggyback on that, that means that instead of having the, like publishers or critics or pe the gatekeepers of any industry to determine a standard of that which is good, it's just a free-for-all now. I mean, so how, how do we get to that process that, that you just described? I mean, the impurities rise to the top. Just like you say, cream rises to the top. But how do you get to the cream when it's just so much in the, in, in, in the jar, in the flask? I mean, there's just so much there that you're just scraping off, scraping well, off, scraping off, and you never get to Well, I hate that. Get I, I, and I don't want this, if this is publicized on the Internet, I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way because I depend upon this tool. Uh, a great deal, but just don't depend on Google. <laughs> you know, uh, wow. get out of a Google, and I hate to say it like that, but get out of a get out of that mindset. Mm. Um, if you if you let if you let your taste, if you have a taste for fine wine, and you and you know what the cream of the crop, you know what the finest wine, you know what it does to your palate, and you choose to lower your standards, that's your choice. That is, that's the the great in the arts and in life in general, that's that free will component. Mm -hmm. And and at the same time, those people who are just putting stuff out there because they have greater access to this worldwide exchange, that's part of their free will as well. I don't know, I don't know if I want a governing body to say, this is good, you can look at this, and this isn't so good because I may at the end of the day get something from that thing that somebody else didn't consider so great. Hmm. And from a practical point of view, you know, uh, when I was in the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, when I was at Augusta College, and when I was working with Daphne, my wife, and her friend Amber on the Corner Club Press, an online literary journal, they would get hundreds of submissions, you know, and that's our problem. It's like, how can we read all these submissions? Well, the only way you can read all of them is to pass some of them on to other people. You know, and you might pass something on to someone else, but you would like it, they don't like it, so they say no on this one. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's always, it's a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. you know, and from a practical point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or you might really like a piece, but your boss, the chief editor, doesn't like it, and mm -hmm. so, of course, it gets put to the side. Yeah. In terms of, of, of the worth of a piece, in the long run of things, we'll never know. We'll be dead before we know if something is worth a darn. That's because true. Because anything that is good stands the test of time. I mean, if you think about the bestsellers from the 1950s, you know, the New York Times bestsellers, how many of them do we still read today? How many of them are considered great pieces of art? You know, or even if you think about the last 20 years, you know, if you think about the number of Harlequin romances that used to sell. People would, you know, make their living off of Harlequin romances, and we don't read those in literature books or anything along those lines, you know. And so, you know, but nobody's reading Harlequin romances anymore. You know, now, sadly enough, they're reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, and I was going to say, yeah, to piggyback on that, because you're in academia, so that is where a different standard is set as opposed to the marketplace. And so what are your thoughts there? Because I think that uh, the way acad academia works, I mean, for you to get your, your, um, your, your master's, you had to write a poem, correct? Or you had to write a thesis. Small, yeah, my thesis was a collection of about 35 to 40 pages of poems. Right. None of which I would like anyone to see now, because I feel as if, you know, I've moved on from there. 
Um, but, you know, I got a lot out of it. And, you know, it was in academia, but the great thing about it was, even though we had to take academic courses, the focus was on our poetry. Mm. And we didn't look at it the same way. You know, there's a big difference between MFA programs in colleges and a PhD in Victorian literature. Okay. One's like a studio, much like a painting MFA. I guess you could say, except you're using words, whereas a PhD in Victorian literature is more analytical, more scholarly, so on and so forth. So, so it's like for, for academia, one teaches you to look within, and the other, or I guess when you go to the next level, it teaches you to uh, study and observe that which was written and stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. I Thank think, you. That, that's a good. And I think that's the great. That's what I've learned when I, when I look at poetry. I look at, or or even music. You know, you think about popular music from the nineteen seventies. No one really listens to it anymore today, unless they make fun of it. Mm -hmm. Because some of that disco, some of that that soft rock with the cheesy lyrics. But don't get me wrong. There's also some great movie, um, great music being written in the seventies. You know, you still have the Stones. You still have Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. You still had very you know, still have music where, where the substance was there. Mm -hmm. And when the, which is also the basis for uh, a lot of what's being written. I, and, you know, music's interesting, and I don't know if, if poetry is this way, but with music, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> tell me the last time, if you understand music theory, tell me the last time a new chord or note's been created. There is nothing new under the sun. It is the manner in which it's arranged. Mm. You know, I tell my student, my creative writing students, that because a cuneiform, I think it was a cuneiform tablet. I don't remember if it was cuneiform or not. It was something, you know, from the Middle East, um, and it was a, um, a, a poet. I don't know if it was Sumerian or whatever. He had, we found we found this little clay tablet, and uh, a poet had written on it. What can I say? Everything has already been said. And this tablet was 3,000, 4,000 years old, and we've still had three to 4,000 years worth of poetry, and three to 4,000 years worth of music, pretty much. Yes, it's an interesting, you, you go back to the 70s, and, and now, I don't know how old you are, Greg, I'm, I'm assuming you're probably late 30s. Yeah, or a little low. Okay, a little, okay. A little higher. Daily note, that's, I, I, I never <laughs> want to go there. See, now I'm only 18, I don't want to offend you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I joke with my students. I say, even though I'm over 30, I still don't trust anyone over 30. There you go. Um, I want you to think, you probably lived through the 80s, matter of fact, talking about one of the oddest times for music and pop culture. It was, it was odd, but at the same time, there have been so many different bands, and not, I would say genres, uh, a twist on a genre. Um, who would have ever thought, I was watching the other day, um, oh, Lord, what was the name? Um, the, two cellos? Two cellos. There's two guys with cellos, and they are phenomenal musicians. They're not just cellos. They're cellos with onboard miking systems and electronic pickups like, a, like an electric guitar. And they're playing everything from classical music to ACDC. So it's a, there are different things in, in, in music that took place, and I think, because I don't believe in luck or coincidence, I think had to take place. I think in every art, in every form of the arts, you had to have an Elvis. Mm -hmm. You had to have a Frank Sinatra. You had to have, from percussion, you had to have a Buddy Rich. Yeah. You had to have a John Bonham. Mm -hmm. John Bonham, there are so many rock drummers in, in, in today's music. And they'll sit down and they'll they'll play a, a, a just a basic four four beat or they'll play a little bit of a syncopated beat and they'll go man you know this really sound cool I, I think I'm onto something you're not onto anything I could probably play three songs off of a Led Zeppelin album that have that sound you got it from somewhere you built off of somebody else's foundation the person you really need to go back and pay homage to is the person who poured the concrete once again I don't think there's anything new under the sun. We, we, just, yeah. I'll just keep, I'll just go ahead. we just build off of it. Yeah. That's all we can do. Yeah. And that's for what I mean, and that includes poetry and music, you know. Um, oh, what Ezra Pound has said, make it new. That's right. Um, and you just do your best with what's already been there. Wow. 
Well, this has been very, very interesting. So if we had to wrap, because we're, we're hitting, hitting the 30-minute uh, 30, 30 mark here, um, are there any closing remarks that you'd like to say with, with regard to your chosen crafts? Because they're all artistic. Um, is there anything, you, any advice you'd like to give to young upstarts who are trying to get into the field of poetry or the field of music? Or maybe they can combine both. Poetry started for me in your past show. You know, all, all the old poems were accompanied by lyrics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it only broke what came down. And like I said earlier, I was talking about the sonnet, it means a little song. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as far as advice for young writers, my only th the thing I think about saying is keep on writing. Don't be discouraged if you get rejected, because everybody gets rejected. And don't do it for money, because you're not going to make a lot of money, probably. <laughs> uh, but the example I always use is Van Gogh. He didn't start painting until he was 35. Everybody thought his paintings were junk. And nobody was interested in them. He sold one in his lifetime. I don't even remember who it was. Maybe it was his brother. It might not have been. I don't know for sure. Um, but look, we still look at Van Gogh. And now one of his paintings, I think, was sold for the highest price that has ever been paid for a painting at an auction. Ever. Yeah, it's a sunflower. Was it the sunflowers? Mm -hmm. So do it. Who cares about getting rejected? Time will tell whether or not your work is worth anything. Mm -hmm. I think with music, uh, as with anything, uh, anything you have a passion about, even at the times, we, we don't think, unfortunately, sometimes we focus, especially if, we're, if we tend to be a perfectionist or perfectionistic, which I don't know anyone like that, so um, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how that is. But um, sometimes we walk away from things in our frustration, especially when it's new. Uh, and I feel like that that has those times have been the times that uh, I've had the most I don't know, the most gumption, I guess, would be to, to go back and, and say, you know, I'm not going to let this defeat me. Uh, I can learn this. I, my my thought is this: if somebody else has done this, and they have the talent, and they have the ability, and I have, may not be them, but I may have some similar qualities and traits, I can probably do it too. And do it because you love it. And if you don't love something, it's just like marriage. Don't marry somebody you don't love. And by God, don't play something you don't love. You know, I don't play country music. Now, I like it, but I don't love it. Um, so you find whatever it is that you love and, and understand that that's like a relationship. Music is a relationship. It's For a drummer, it's the relationship between you and your drums. And there are days they're not going to feel like sounding good, and there are days you're not going to feel like working with them to make them sound good. Um, but just remember that that day doesn't have to be forever. Um, tomorrow can change. The, the next moment can change. So just pour your heart into something and, and don't give up. If it's something you want, go after it. Mm. Wow, words, wise words, wise words. Mm. Gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. Um, but we're going to um, post this up to uh, YouTube, and here's to getting many, many hits. <laughs>